Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, and I'm very pleased that you uh, have taken the opportunity to join us today for the second in a series of three programs entitled Alaska Native Corporations in Context, Advancing Alaska Native Peoples and Communities. Uh, I would say that this is backed by popular demand, and it is, but I'll also tell you that it's a continuum of programs uh, that are policy driven, but reality set. And so I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, again today for this program. Uh, we're spanning uh, across the globe with folks watching in from, from all over the world uh, for this important discussion. I want to thank some colleagues. First and foremost, I want to thank Alunic Corporation for their continued support of the Polar Institute's work here in Washington, DC and elsewhere. Also our history and public uh, policy program at the Wilson Center for their uh, continued support as well. Uh, the ANCSA Regional Association and Alaska Native Village Association as well. And as always, Michaela Stith for making sure that the Polar Institute is not just on task, but performing to the level we've all come to expect. Uh, let me also thank uh, colleagues uh, here in DC at the Meridian International Center and also the Department of State. Earlier uh, this week, I had an opportunity to speak to a program called International Visitors Leadership Program. And they have uh, five colleagues from the Canadian North who are exploring, investigating, and in their daily lives, working on a lot of the issues you will hear about today. So they're also participating online as well. They'll be watching and likely looking for connections, not only to the panelists, but perhaps those participating in the discussion today. So I want to welcome you all to this uh, program. And now I'd like to turn this program over to my friend and colleague, Kim Redmeyer. Kim? Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, and an enormous thank you for the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center for hosting this event. We are delighted to be back for another installment in our series, Alaska Native Corporations in Context. My name is Kim Reitmeyer. I'm the Executive Director of the ANCSA Regional Association, which represents the 12 Alaska Native Regional Corporations. Our member organizations proudly represent over 140,000 Alaska Native people. ARA's purpose is to promote and foster the continued growth and economic strength of our member organizations on behalf of their Alaska Native shareholders. I am Supiak. My family is from Kodiak, Alaska. I'm a member of the Shunak tribe of Kodiak and a proud shareholder of my Native corporation, Koniag. When it comes to Alaska Native corporations, we often say that we are a different kind of corporation. Alaska Native corporations were established by Congress in 1971 through the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, or ANCSA, to be socially responsible for-profit entities tasked with promoting the social, cultural, and economic advancement of Alaska Native people and communities. Unlike conventional corporations, the shareholders established under ANCSA were Alaska Native people. As you'll hear from our panelists, COVID has been uniquely challenging for many Alaska Native communities. And even before the pandemic, many daily comforts taken for granted in the lower 48 were luxuries in Alaska, such as road access and broadband connection. But despite these challenges, Alaska Native people are proud to call Alaska home and even more proud of our history and culture that lives on today. Alaska Native corporations are different and as bold as the people we represent. We hope today's panel will give you a deeper understanding of why the uniqueness of Alaska living and Alaska Native people require a different approach. So thank you for joining us today and let's get started. It's my honor to introduce Raina Seal, Senior Advisor for Alaska Affairs and Strategic Priorities for the Department of Interior. Prior to being appointed to the Department of Interior, Interior Raina served as Associate Director of Intergovernmental Affairs in the Obama-Biden White House. She also served at the Office of Management and Budget, where she worked on a variety of energy and international issues. She received her Master's in Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and her Bachelor's Degree from Yale College. Raina, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so thrilled to have you open up our conversation. Over to you. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you to uh, all of you for having me here today, uh, including the Polar Institute, 
the AXA Regional Association, and the Alaska Native Village Corporations Association. Um, you know, I, I am from the Bristol Bay region of Alaska. I am myself a shareholder. Uh, so really this event is a special uh, way for me to speak to not just the priorities of the department that I currently work for, which is the Department of the Interior uh, for Secretary Deb Holland, but also to talk a little bit about um, how ANCs and how ANCSA has really influenced my upbringing and uh, in my life. So I'm really excited to be here to speak a little bit about that today. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was a unique milestone uh, between Alaska Natives and the United States. Legislators and advocates struggled with how to integrate self-determination into the resolution of land claims in our state. Alaska Native corporations are an enduring reflection of what that conversation and struggle can produce if we commit to self-determination and to each other. Throughout our state's history, Alaska Natives have at times had to insist upon recognition of their rights to ensure that indigenous life ways can continue. Even though our system in Alaska is different than anywhere else in the country, we have worked hard over generations to ensure that the system works for us. That service delivery landscape uh, meets the needs of Alaska Natives, whether rural or urban living. Alaska Native corporations themselves are a core part of AIMSA, and they have grown and evolved over time to a point that was likely unfathomable 50 years ago. ANCs are a major component of Alaska's economy. Uh, as we all know, the largest private landowners and among the largest employers of Alaskans. They provide jobs, they provide wages, and other benefits addressing the cultural, environmental, physical, and socioeconomic needs and concerns of Alaska Native shareholders statewide. Partnerships are expanding beyond corporations to include many of the community-driven organizations and associations they sponsored, and some which sponsored them to advance the quality of village and urban life. While adapting to the growing complexity of participating in government programs remains a challenge, Native leadership has shown what focusing on building your community can accomplish in any sphere. I myself am a product of the unique service delivery system in Alaska. I was raised on Alaska Native Healthcare, which is a subsidiary of an ANC. Uh, we put food on the table due to both my parents' shareholder status, and I received scholarships as an ANC descendant, which enabled me to uh, be the first in my family to attend college. Beyond that, ANCs can also help to strengthen a connection to one's roots. I was raised in both rural and urban Alaska. So when I lived in rural Alaska, you know, we lived mostly a subsistence lifestyle, uh, similar to our ancestors. But in urban Alaska, it's a bit harder to maintain that connection. ANC's cultural programming really helps to bridge that gap for many young people. Of course, our system is not without its difficulties, and the importance of tribal sovereignty in Alaska cannot be overstated. Our tribes play a special and crucial role in the service delivery landscape of our communities along with consortia. They are also the holders of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with our federal government. Many tribes and ANCs work hand-in-hand -hand to ensure the health and prosperity of our Native communities. My boss, Secretary Deb Holland, understands the importance of Alaska and the complexities of our system. This is in part why she hired me to serve as her senior staff person and uh, lead on Alaska issues. I am the first Alaska Native to serve in this position. I think that really speaks to the Secretary's prioritization of Alaska and Alaska Native issues. As I've mentioned, I am so proud to be here to introduce this session and to celebrate the proud history of ANCSA 50 years later, and to help push forward the collective goals of all facets of our Alaska Native leadership. So I thank you for inviting me to be here. Raina, thank you very much uh, for those, not just uh, foundational comments to this discussion, but also the personal connections to the issues we're going to talk about. We know that you have an incredibly busy schedule. So thank you for taking time out of that schedule. And we know that you have to rush off to other meetings that are, that are pressing uh, your time and your efforts. So thank you again. And thank you for representing the state of Alaska in Washington, DC and making sure an important voice is being heard. Thank you for your time, Raina. So while Raina transitions off to her other meetings, uh, let me now move the program forward by inviting uh, our three uh, Alaska Native leaders and panelists to the discussion. Uh, I will briefly introduce them, but then we've asked each of them to spend three or four minutes uh, introducing themselves. So our panelists for today 
are Jaylene Kukesh, Jason Matrokin, and Nathan McCowan. And as you will soon find out, there are many reasons why we wanted not only their experiences to be uh, shared with you, but also their perspectives and their leadership to be understood and shared with you. So let me begin with Jaylene, and then we'll go to Jason and Nathan. Jaylene, please, and thank you. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, as Mike indicated, my name is Jaylene Kukash. I am the Vice President for Policy and Legal Affairs and also the Corporate Secretary for Sea Alaska Corporation. Um, I have been in this role for 13 years now. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, at the law firm of Van Ness Feldman in Washington, DC. I like to say I'm a recovered Washingtonian. Uh, it's been uh, a quick several years at Sea Alaska, though I can't believe it's been 13 years. Um, more properly, I need to introduce myself as well. Um, my Tlingit name is Kajuhain. I am Raven in Dog Salmon Clan. Tekwedi uh, Yeti Ayahat, I am a child of the brown bear. Koyakan Athabaskan Dutch Kun Ayahat, I'm also a child of the Koyakan Athabaskan. My mother's from the interior of Alaska. Uh, I grew up in Angoon, which is one of our villages in Southeast Alaska. Um, usually, I am on Tlingit Ani in Southeast Alaska in the Akkwan Territory. Today, I'm in Duwamish Territory in Washington State. Um, I graduated from Stanford University uh, many years ago. I won't say how long ago. Uh, and I did my legal training at University of Washington and uh, University of New Mexico. I graduated with my JD and my Indian Law Certificate from UNM. Uh, and have used that experience to work uh, both in Washington, D.C., but also now in Alaska for our Alaska Native people. So I'm really excited to be here and happy to share some of my experience working for an Alaska Native corporation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you to the Wilson Center and Mike um, for this time today. I'm Jason Matrokin. I'm the president and CEO for Bristol Bay Native Corporation was born and raised here in Anchorage, Alaska, where I'm residing and working here today. Um, my family ancestry comes from uh, Kodiak Island, as well as Bristol Bay and the Aleutian Islands. I am um, a Lutik, a Sukpiak from Southwest Alaska. My father was born and raised um, both on the island of Kodiak and in the village of Naknek in Bristol Bay. My mother comes from uh, uh, just outside of the Boston area on the East Coast. I'm growing up here in Anchorage, attending high school, and uh, my undergraduate degree from Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in Western Massachusetts gave me an opportunity to experience a little bit of my mother's side of the family and where she came from. Um, but I also received my master's degree here uh, at Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, my career started after college with uh, a local bank here, National Bank of Alaska, which was then acquired by Wells Fargo. And I worked for uh, uh, both banks for a number of years before I started in the nonprofit sector uh, with First Alaskans Institute, a statewide uh, uh, native nonprofit organization focusing on public policy and leadership development. I then started working for my corporation, Bristol Bay Native Corporation, in uh, 2003, actually on its board of directors to start, and then management team thereafter, and started as president and CEO in 2009. I uh, am a BBNC shareholder. I inherited shares from my late grandfather, Walter Matrokin, and uh, just proud to be a shareholder working for my corporation and leading the corporation in this very new world that we're living in. Uh, BBNC has had a, a, a run of success for, for our nearly 50 years in business, and we're very much for, uh, looking forward to the future and where we can go from here. Um, my family lives here in Anchorage, including my parents and sister. And it's a wonderful place to raise a family. And I really look forward to the discussion today. So thanks again, Mike. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nathan McCowan. I'm the president and CEO of St. George Tana Corporation. That's one of the village corporations uh, pursuant to ANCSA, the one specifically for St. George Island, uh, one of the two purple offs in the middle of the Bering Sea. Uh, I am also the chair of the Alaska Native Village Corporations Association, which represents all 177 uh, village corporations that are left remaining. Um, as Jaylene uh, led, I also have to introduce myself uh, uh, culturally. So uh, 
yn dokyn iaith yw chadw a soc ca plus a chadach chadsiti. My clinket name is Yanda Kyn Iaith. Um, I'm a member of the Shishakadi, uh, the Koho clan. Gunuhu uh, Kwan Dachan Dachredi Dachan Ka Nongan Dachan. I'm from, uh, my clan's from Gunuhu, which is a village that no longer exists, uh, just south of Yakutat. I'm a grandchild of the Anungan, the Aleut. Uh, my grandfather was from St. George and was later adopted into a Klinket clan. Kohun Yadich Chatsiti. My uh, dad's family are uh, Scottish. Uh, we're a Scottish clan, the Cahoons, which are from Loch Lomond in Scotland. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate the Polar Institute and the Wilson Center uh, hosting this. Um, I've been the president CEO of St. George Tana for eight years now. Um, the villages um, you know, are dedicated usually to a single community. And so I spent a lot of time working with my grandfather's people. Um, before that, I worked for uh, one of my regional corporations. Um, I'm a shareholder of Alute Corporation as well as Sea Alaska Corporation. Um, and spent uh, almost 10 years working for Sea Alaska uh, for my grandmother's people. Um, I like to joke that uh, after after I finished uh, university, my grandparents uh, had an arm wrestling match about where I was going to go. And uh, grandma cheats a lot, so I ended up in uh, southeast for ten years. Um, and then eventually, she uh, she let grandpa have a turn. Um, I uh, received my bachelor's degree from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and then my master's degree from Harvard University. And uh, so it's uh, it's been uh, quite a quite an experience to to be able to. Uh, get that education and bring it home. Uh, that was a very important thing to my grandparents uh, for all of us grandchildren to pursue our educations. Uh, it was an expectation to then uh, utilize that to, to better our peoples. Uh, most importantly of all, you know, I'm a, a, a very, uh, a, a, I have a very loving wife, uh, one that I probably don't deserve, as well as two uh, beautiful children um, who are, uh, you know, probably causing my wife more uh, consternation than is necessary given it's summertime. So. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Well, as you can see, we've got a fabulous lineup of panelists today. Uh, and similar to our, our last event, uh, we have a few great videos to share with you along our journey today and to help visualize how ANCs are uniquely different. This first video segment is from Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, ASRC, and needs little to no introductions. Um, every time I see this video, I get goosebumps. And I really hope that it sets the stage today in providing uh, an incredible visual of the uniqueness and magic of Alaska and our Alaska Native people. Our feet were not the first to touch this land. Our steps following a well-worn path. Footprints planted deep by those long, long ago. Our fathers, our mothers, our leaders, the cold whisper of snow as their eyes gazed out on this vast, beautiful expanse that is our home. Those sacred hands, which for generations reached out and gathered the rich harvest, celebrating the bounty from the land and from the sea. Even then, so long ago, they saw us, knew us, led us, prepared us with wisdom, with knowledge, with foresight. Our lives echo with the wisdom of a thousand years. Honor, respect, 
love for our people, our land, our traditions, our culture, even as our past greets the future. Even as we turn our gaze to the horizon, we are still one people, a blessed people. We are Nupak. We are ASRC. This is our story. Uh, Kim, I, it's, it's very rare that I get caught for words, but I just got caught for words. I got just totally uh, zoned in there on that uh, journey. That was a great two and a half minute journey, so I apologize for that. Uh, but there's nothing better. I mean, many of us try to explain, describe, share uh, the landscape that we live in and that we love. Nothing better than, than something like that. And it gets better because now I'm going to ask our panelists to uh, speak with us about uh, the connections of, of landscape, culture, connections, service to state, service to communities, service to the people that they are, that they are of. So I wanna ask each of you who have a rich family history in Alaska and maybe more specifically within the Alaska Native Corporations organization to share uh, some knowledge that your parents or grandparents have passed along to you that you've taken to heart um, as as you run or play a key leadership role in your organizations, all of us have that knowledge from, from our elders and from our families, but you've been able to take that and then apply it in service to the people you serve in the Alaska Native Corporation structure. And I am not clear that many people understand the connections and the power and how your, your personal experience inform and influence your leadership. So maybe I can ask you for that for an answer to a very complicated and very personal question, but maybe Nathan, Jason, Jaylene, maybe we can go in that order if you if you would like to share with us a little bit more on that issue, please. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, it's a, not an easy question to, to, to get down to a terse answer. Um, my my family was was knee deep in in land claims uh, since the 1920s. Uh, my grandfather, great grandfather Judson Brown. Uh, Shaka Kuni uh, was the uh, secretary for the Alaska Native Brotherhood Grand Camp Convention where uh, they made the decision, the Shlingit people of Southeast made the decision to uh, sue the United States uh, in order to reclaim the lands that had been, they felt would have been um, illegally dispossessed. Um, that was the start of the, the land claims, the real legal aspects of the land claims movement. Um, and so my great grandfather remained um, involved uh, through the entirety of uh, to ANCSA in 1971 after he was on the board of Sea Alaska, was later the chair of the board. Uh, my my Aleut grandfather, Flory uh, Lekhanov, um, um, because he was able to, um, uh, through a series of events, be able to go and get his bachelor's degree and his master's degree, one of the very few Alaska natives in the 50s that, that was educated. Um, was uh, in the thick of the development of the regional uh, entities, um, help along with uh, Evil Nadi started uh, the Cook Inlet Native Association, which later became uh, Siri, um, started the, uh, the Aleut League, which uh, sounds like a really obscure uh, minor league baseball system, but is actually the uh, group of, uh, of villages that later became the uh, uh, Lucian Islands Privilege uh, Association. Uh, uh, and the regional nonprofit for the for the Aleutians, and uh, later he helped co-found uh, AFN, uh, which was really the instrumental entity for um, consolidating and focusing the land claims movement. Uh, he was the first chair, so uh, you know, early as a young boy, um, Alaska Native corporations, Alaska Native politics was just something that was all around me. Um, I can remember my great grandfather as a young boy, I, he, I was a young boy, he sat me on his knee and he said, he had a really deep voice, you're going to work for the corporation one day. And I had no idea what he was talking about, but he uh, happened to be, uh, you know, quite a soothsayer because it, it later came true. You know, my, my grandparents um, deeply, uh, deeply etched two important values in, into all of us. Uh, one was the value of education. Um, they, they really did believe that uh, the only way for us to stand up as a people 
was to gain skills, gain experience, gain knowledge uh, of the outside world, but also of our own worlds. Um, they very much, uh, you know, spoke the native languages around the house as much as they could, taught us, uh, you know, as much as the, uh, we, we were willing to take up <laughs> the, our traditional ways. Um, and then number two, they also valued uh, service. And, um, you know, the, 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 the name Alaska Native Corporation may not sound like a service organization, but for any of us who are in it on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, these are our families, these are our communities. This is, this is giving back. Um, we've, we've had enormous investments in us over our lives, um, and now it's our turn. Um, in Southeast, there's an expression, um, you know, at birth, you're given a name, and, and for a portion of your life, uh, your name carries you. And then at a certain point in time, you've got to start carrying your name. And so I think that's what uh, all of my uh, distinguished colleagues here are doing is carrying their names. What a, what a great line to, to transition. Thank you for that. Uh, Jason, please. Yeah, it's my pleasure. My great question. You know, I've had the good fortune of being surrounded by very wonderful leaders in my family and even in my wife's family. Uh, my, my lineage is really more um, about commercial fishing in Southwest Alaska, Kodiak Island, uh, in Bristol Bay. And my, my grandparents, my grandfather, my great uncle were all, of course, my father and, and even my mother's uh, brothers living in Kodiak were all commercial fishermen. Uh, it's a very entrepreneurial form of leadership, um, being a small business and a commercial fish fisherman and captain of their boats. It's a, it's a very strong entrepreneurial lineage that comes from many parts of our coastal communities. Um, my father, who was also the president and CEO of his regional corporation, uh, Koniak Inc., um, really was, was able to pass down a whole number of, of um, great mentoring opportunities and, and leadership skills. But his second career was with the Alaska National Guard. He had a 30-year history working with the Alaska National Guard under some wonderful native leadership, both uh, General Jake Lestenkoff and General John Schaefer. My father was the command sergeant major here in Alaska and there's probably not a community that I've been to where somebody hasn't said, I knew your dad, what a great leader working in the National Guard. And of course his, his uh, tenure as, as CEO for, for Kuniag uh, really just, you know, I didn't appreciate it as much when I was younger uh, as most Teenagers and twenty-somethings have their own their own path they want to carve. But lo and behold, here I sit, following in the same footsteps as my father, uh, working for my my regional corporation. Um, I've worked for some great leaders uh, over the years, both with my time at National Bank of Alaska, um, and and with First Alaskans Institute, and even my father-in-law started uh, a banking institution here in Alaska, which. I don't know even how one starts a bank, but he was able to pull it off out of an ATCO trailer in a parking lot. So um, it's, it's been a, a, a great way to absorb and experience through their own lives and their own um, um, business experiences for myself to take on all that great knowledge and, and, and pass it on to even our staff here at Bristol Bay Native Corporation. You know, I, I just feel very rich with, with the ability to take what they've done for our state uh, for our communities and, and carry that ball forward. So it's, um, I, I, just, I just feel very fortunate. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Jaylene, is this, uh, can I impose upon you for a little bit of your story as well? Yes, and, and thanks for asking. Um, my earliest memories are actually in Seattle, Washington. My parents were at the University of Washington. My dad was in law school, my mom was in college. Um, and so very early on, I knew the importance of education. Um, and I've tried to instill that also in my children. Uh, I failed to mention I have twin daughters who just finished their first year of college remotely, sadly, thanks to COVID. One's at UCLA and one's at Stanford. And then my son just finished his freshman year of high school. And, you know, my parents... Um, instilled in us the importance of education and also serving uh, in our community. Um, my dad served on the Sea Alaska board since 1976. I was a mere three years old when he joined the Sea Alaska board. And so I grew up always hearing Sea Alaska, 
Kutsnuu, which was our village corporation, which she also worked for as management. Uh, I heard ANCSA, I heard AFN, I heard ANB, Alaska Native Brotherhood, um, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Um, my dad served on the Sea Alaska board for 45 years until his passing two weeks ago. So um, I appreciate the sensitivity to the question because it's still very fresh and very raw. Um, but at the same time, I have to channel my dad's strength to share his story. Um, he served in so many different entities throughout the state. He was a state legislator for 16 years in the House and the Senate. He was an AFN co-chair for 16 years. Um, he was a Sea Alaska Heritage Institute trustee and, and he was a chair of our Sea Alaska board for 16 years, I believe. Um, he really instilled and not only me, but I think in a lot of young Native people, the importance of service to our Alaska Native community. Um, as a child, my dad was on the road a lot. He traveled a lot and thank, thankful for my mother for being that woman behind him so that he could do all the important things that he did. And my sister noted at his service two weeks ago that it was hard for us when he left a lot, but now that we saw all the support and all the people who came to wish us well and to see my dad in his final days. We can recognize how important his work was and how important it was for him to be out there and how important his work was for our Alaska Native people and the legacy he left behind. Uh, his legacy of serving our Native people of serving our community, of prioritizing family, and always helping those who need it will always be there. His mentorship and just his wisdom and guidance that he left with so many will live on. So I guess if I, I'm looking to answer your question, <laughs> It's, it's been my dad and all the people that were around me because of him. I grew up around not only him, but Morris Thompson, Byron Malott, uh, just so many native leaders, uh, Al Adams, you name it, <laughs> Oliver Levitt, all of these people have been around my life, Julie Kitka, um, so having that leadership of my dad also allowed me to be around so many other leaders. So I, I guess I just would end in saying that my dad's legacy will live on and I and others will continue to serve our Alaska Native people and serving our Alaska Native corporations was a big part of my dad's life and, and it will continue to be a big part of mine. So, so thank you for the question for having a chance to just mention my dad's name, Albert Kukash, Native leader. Senator, uh, just an amazing person. So thank you. A good man <clears throat> and a good friend. And Jaylene, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, those incredibly important but personal reflections. And it is our honor to allow for that to happen. Many of us uh, knew, celebrated, laughed with, <clears throat> and listened to your father. We will miss his voice, but uh, like the landscape behind you, he has helped to shape our state and more importantly, he's helped to help shape communities all over the state of Alaska. And his wisdom, frankly, went beyond the borders of our own state, as you know. So thank you for sharing that very powerful statement. I think folks are understanding why these are not just corporations, right? There's a, there's a bigger mission here. These are not jobs. These are missions. And they're missions to ensure that culture and heritage and what is important to communities is sustained and thrived while working in a world, a globalized Arctic, a globalized world where corporations and corporate structures are a necessity, but these corporations are rooted in values. And as far as my experience has been, never has lost who they serve and why they serve <clears throat> the people that they serve. Um, speaking of that connection, Nathan, I wonder if I can impose upon you uh, you know, I've heard you share some great stories about a day in the life of 
you, you've done this for us uh, privately, uh, that really demonstrates the balancing act of, uh, of Alaska Native Corporation and a leader of an Alaska Native Corporation operating in a business that's able to provide benefits to Alaska Native people while also ensuring that the business honors the culture and the traditions of the people that it serves. So can you give us an overview of what your day looks like as a CEO uh, of, of, your, of your corporation and the people that you lead? Because you do live in not just two worlds, multiple worlds. Sure, sure. Thank you, Mike. First, uh, Jay, um, the, yeah, the, you know, to answer the question of the day in the life, um, you know, it's pretty standard, like, you know, any other, you know, corporation would be, you know, uh, getting ready for the next polo match, uh, you know, luge lessons, you know, it's, it's, it's that type of normal stuff, you know, we, uh, the, the, the problem with uh, working at Alaska Native Corporation is people tend to fixate on the corporation portion um, and, and they forget the Alaska Native. Um, each of the three words are actually, I think, uh, fairly emblematic of what happens in a typical day. Um, there's almost always an Alaska portion, there's almost always a Native portion, and there's almost always a corporation portion. Um, on, on the, the native uh, front, you know, it could be something as uh, simple as, you know, what's happening with a particular person in the community who's really struggling. Um, maybe they lost their parents and somebody says, hey, you, you know, we really need to reach out to them and, and, and chat with them and see how they're doing. Um, it could be somebody who's uh, mourning the death of a loved one and needs uh, uh, help of working, navigating through the, the ability to, to have money to be able to return to the community, um, to be able to bury their loved one. It could be um, working with the tribe on particular programs um, that are uh, relevant to the community. The village corporations, um, each of the individual village corporations are dedicated to usually to a specific community, tied to a specific community. And so we are in the weeds on a day-to-day on -day basis with questions about infrastructure and economic development. Um, you know, I, you know, on random days, I'll have questions about, you know, how many reindeer should be harvested uh, from our herd on the island. Um, you know, you know, everything from busted sewer pipes you know, to uh, how are we going to, you know, set up the, uh, you know, the, the, the site of the, the, the wind farm uh, to, you know, what are we doing about a particular roof? Um, uh, it, it really gets to the nuances of, you know, should we be ordering these type of galvanized nails or that type of galvanized nail? Um, you know, then on the on the corporation front, um, you know, it's the it's, you know, these are these are economic engines for the prosperity of our people. And uh, they they have a capitalist model, and so we make uh, we make no umbrages about that. Uh, that uh, an important part of what we have to do is we have to uh, develop uh, returns uh, for our shareholders. Um, so that's the gamut of business meetings from uh, marketing and sales uh, to human resources to IT uh, to strategy to partnerships um, uh, all the all the way down from the the, the smallest of uh, infrastructure and process to the biggest of uh, long term planning um, and and uh, you know working with the board of directors uh, is a, a great privilege uh, to be able to access. You know, the wisdom of the, the elders that we have, the, the, the younger folks who are, who are really driving and striving, um, and, and that's a key portion of it as well. And then finally, on the Alaska piece, um, that really has to do with our, our, our nature as being products of the public policy process. Um, Alaska Native corporations weren't developed by a group of people who thought that there was a market opportunity, and so they decided to pool their capital together in order to take advantage of it. We flow out of the public policy process. We uh, were, were, were created by Congress as part of uh, negotiated settlement of our land claims. Um, and we have to be uh, inextricably intertwined uh, with uh, policy uh, dynamics, both on the state level, uh, but also on the federal level. So a typical day is gonna be thinking about what is happening with the Alaska budget and uh, what's happening with capital expenditures, what's happening with uh, programs to subsidize energy. Um, it could be going to DC and talking about, uh, you know, major or minor amendments to ANCSA itself uh, or other laws that are that are integral to helping our people survive. 
and thrive. Um, and it could be international issues as well. Uh, there's a summit happening in Switzerland. Uh, there's a great power uh, conflict between China, Russia, and the Arctic. Our, our island, our lands, uh, the people, the other regions are at the, at the crossroads of the Arctic. We're the gateway to the Arctic. And so what happens on the international sphere is something that we have to pay attention to as well. So it, it runs the full gamut, Mike, of uh, you know, everything from paying attention to what's happening at the UN all the way to uh, what's going on at uh, uh, Sally and Jim's house down at the end of the, end of the village. That, that's a thank you. I mean, that, that's not just comprehensive, but that provides so many focal lenses into what you do. And then by, by result, what happens within the organization and then all the way back to the community. But I like the fact, Nathan, you brought it from local, local to regional to global, right? Local, regional, national, global, and how all of that works together as best as you possibly can, playing bumper cars with all of the different incomings from which nails to buy and which piece of legislation in DC you need to inform and influence. I think that gives us a great idea of the comprehension of, of, and sophistication that is needed uh, to serve all of, all of your communities. So maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Jason and Jaylene as well to, to now join us again. And I'd like to ask your thoughts fairly quickly, not so quick though that we, we don't get the right message, but how do you think about success? I mean, Nathan just gave us some thoughts, but how do you think about success for your organizations and your communities? And Jaylene, I know that in particular, maybe I could put you on the spot to talk, maybe focus your comments on, on social services ANCs provide, but, uh, and maybe start with you Jaylene and then we'll go to, to Jason if that is okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, I guess I would start with generally the fact that the more successful our corporations are, the more we can do for our people. Uh, and so it's been such a blessing and an honor to be a part of Sea Alaska's recent successes over the past couple of years. We've had our most successful financial years over the past three or four years. Uh, and because of that, we've been able to add to our benefits for shareholders. For example, we added $10 million to our scholarship endowment, so it's now at $15 million. We added a bereavement benefit to help our shareholder families when someone in their family passes away. Uh, we created a language endowment to preserve our native languages. Uh, we invest in, in cultural programs and cultural events, such as our biannual celebration, which we hope to have again next year. We had to cancel because of COVID this last time around. Uh, we have more internship positions available than we've ever had and more interns applying for positions. Uh, we can contribute to other organizations that support our native people and our native communities. Uh, for example, when COVID hit, uh, we had no idea any CARES Act was even a, po a potential possibility for us, um, but we knew right away we had to help our tribes and our local organizations. So Sea Alaska quickly donated over a million dollars, a million and a quarter to our tribes, to our tribal organizations, to our communities, to our food banks, you name it, we were contributing. So I would say our success is very much intertwined with how we can help our people um, uh, socially, uh, culturally, physically. Uh, it's, it's very important. And it's just been such an honor to be a part of that and to be successful, to find success and be able to pay it forward to our people and benefit them in, in very important and critical ways. Thank you, Jason. First of all, Mike, um, Jaylene, wow your beautiful tribute to your father was just really, um, you know, it was, it was wonderful to hear and, and powerful at the same time. I had the good fortune of working when I was at First Alaskans Institute many years ago for your father on our board of directors and many of the names that you mentioned and just sitting around the table hearing about their stories, their experiences, their passion and their vision helped me to where I'm at today. So thank you for, for um, offering that up. Similar to Nathan and Jaylene, um, Alaska Native corporations are in so many ways unique to not only Alaska, but to the world. There are similarities amongst the regional corporations and, and even the village corporations. So much of what Bristol Bay Native Corporation provides for with our shareholder base, our communities, our region, you know, Nathan and Jaylene spoke of in some ways. I would also add that um, 
within the Alaska Native corporate structure, it may not be that uncommon, but throughout the rest of the world, be hard pressed to find a corporation where their values and even their policies, in our case, put fish first. Fish, Alaska, um, and Bristol Bay wild salmon are the backbone of our economy. They're, a, they're, they're, the, they're, they're the food that's on the table. They're a part of the social framework. And we, we value fish as one of our cultural and corporate values. We also have a policy that places fish first, meaning in any business decision we make, we want to make sure that the fishery is thriving, it's sustainable, and it's healthy. Because if our fishery is healthy, that means the corporation is healthy, the people are healthy. And so that is a part of the framework of Bristol Bay Native Corporation. And sure, at the end of the day, our net earnings, our bottom line are very important to the corporate structure. However, that healthy bottom line feeds our families, feeds our people, feeds our region and our communities. And going beyond the bottom line, BBNC is also providing for many of the same benefits that Jalen and Nathan both mentioned. In addition, we are working at, uh, on ways to um, catalog and archive the native place names of many of the villages and rivers and streams and subsistence grounds that our people have survived on for thousands of years because those names are not archived anywhere. Uh, those native languages need to be um, uh, strengthened and, and, and taught. And so Bristol Bay Native Corporation is looking for ways and, and is working on ways that we can make sure that our, our communities um, are sustainable forever. Uh, really thinking about um, the way in which we engage with our shareholders, what they expect from the corporation, what their responsibilities are as a shareholder. These are things that people had to learn 50 years ago of what it means to be a shareholder of the corporation. But going beyond the actual shares themselves and, and making sure that the corporation represents them at the table, as Nathan mentioned, at the international stage, the, the, the national stage, and even our, our local government stage, uh, Bristol Bay Native Corporation is always looking for ways to be innovative, uh, unique, but representative and respectful of our past, because that's what got us here. Thank you, Jason. Good. That's just what a great uh, story to take us on. Really, really grounding and really um, insightful. Thank you so much. Kim, uh, let me turn this back over to you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thank you, Jason, Nathan, and Jaylene for sharing your stories. Always so powerful to hear. Uh, I think this is a really good point for us to show our next video segment. Um, this video was created by Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, or Siri, a little over 10 years ago uh, for their celebration of the 40th anniversary of ANCSA. It features Margie Brown and Roy Hundorf. Margie Brown was initially, uh, she initially began, began her career Siri in 1976. She held numerous positions in the company, including serving as the president and CEO from 2005 to 2013. Uh, joining Margie on the video is Roy Hundor, who has been a, a member of the Siri Board of Directors since 2002. Uh, everyone on the call today knows these names very well. Uh, and this is a great reflection where Margie and Roy are looking upon the early challenges of ANCSA while they were doing the creation of Siri. We have every, every native uh, group or uh, entity in the state is embodied in our shareholder base. And so they look to Siri as a very strong link to their cultural past. We have, can take pride in having people associate with us uh, and, with, and connecting to their culture through the corporation. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, most people never anticipated that the corporations would use their, their money and their status as sort of a toolbox to do things that were considered outside of the realm of corporate activity, such as health care, such as uh, 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 social services, such as housing. Um, we have the nonprofit activities that, you know, we, for example, we have a health corporation that, that has a $200 million budget now and employs 1,500 people and delivers first class health care. Um, we have a foundation that, that, has a, that has a corpus of about 50 million and distributes, uh, has distributed millions in scholarships over the last 20 years. Um, we have a housing corporation that works to provide shareholder housing. 
Uh, we work at the same time to preserve culture through this KNVA as one of the things, the Her Alaska Native Heritage Center. Um, so we've used it as kind of a toolbox to do all of these things uh, that needed to be done, that were outside of the realm of corporation activity. That's uh, a nice uh, reflection back, but but wonderfully sets us up for now and, and the future. And just listening to those uh, those leaders of, of the state and thinking about all, and that was ten years ago, right, Kim? So thinking about now, a decade later, what that's about uh, in terms of service to community. So so maybe Nathan, uh, you know, we're all dealing in this pandemic, uh, trying to weave ourselves through this. And the Siri video gives us a, a snapshot into how social and cultural needs are, are woven into the very DNA, the very fabric of, of the Alaska Native corporations. So maybe I can impose upon you uh, to talk a little bit about the services that have that have been provided that became even more critical uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. So you know, when the when the pandemic um, you know the pandemic hit last last spring. And we saw the you know immediate shutdown nationwide, worldwide, um, and and now that the pandemic is starting to wane, you know we are beginning to to see how it affected different communities um, disproportionately hard. Um, the Alaska Native community, um, you know, didn't walk into the pandemic, uh, you know, with uh, tremendous amounts of wealth and capacity and and. Um, you know, everybody was, you know, as healthy as can be. Um, you know, we, we our, our communities typically start off with lower health indexes. Uh, many of the uh, rural areas, there's 30 communities that still don't have running water. Uh, 170 of the communities can only be accessed by boat or plane. There was enormous obstacles in the first place uh, just, to, just to sort of day-to-day -day life and, and, and healthful living. And the pandemic took all of those um, all, all of those challenges and, and put it on steroids. Um, there were points in time over the course of, of the winter where various communities had the highest uh, rate of spread of anywhere in the world. Um, individual communities with a thousand people that had six hundred cases, seven hundred cases, um, and that's that's before we start talking about the economic impacts. Uh, many parts of rural Alaska. Um, if you looked at their unemployment numbers, uh, you looked at their per capita income, um, it would stagger the average American because a good year for unemployment might be 20% unemployment, 25% unemployment. Um, there's areas that, that can get to 70, 80% unemployment at a given point in time. And the pandemic took all of those bad, bad indicators and made them worse. Um, so consequently, you know, our people were seeking help wherever they could. Um, you know, no matter what uh, corporation you're talking about, no matter the wealthiest, most successful, most forward thinking, um, highest capacity uh, corporation out there, we don't have the resources to be able to complete the, the hierarchy and needs that our people have, but we're going to do our best. And so we did. Uh, we stepped up in every way we possibly could. Uh, various corporations working on food service delivery, various corporations putting together temporary housing, various corporations banding together to try to uh, uh, ensure the continuity of, of, um, air uh, of air flight service to various communities. Um, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a heavy lift. And, and again, you know, we, we don't have all the resources, so we did the best we could. Um, Congress recognized that. Congress understood that uh, the Alaska Native corporations have a fundamental role in, in Alaska Native well-being, and that's why um, they wanted to bring us resources just as they wanted to bring resources to the states, localities, and the tribes. Um, an important thing to remember in all this uh, is that uh, the, there are tribes in Alaska that, that don't have, uh, by, by their constitution, the ability to service every one of their citizens. Uh, many times, if you leave the village, um, the, the tribal constitution says that the tribe doesn't provide you services anymore. There are more than 60,000 Alaska Natives who receive uh, various services only through an Alaska Native corporation. And uh, so it's, it was imperative uh, and remains imperative that we be, that we be continue to be supported uh, just, as, just as tribes are. So, you know, the, the, the pandemic has... Um, 
you know, obviously it's been an extraordinarily difficult time. Uh, obviously it's, it's, it's still a challenge and will remain a challenge and echo of, of, of these events will, will linger for many, many years. One thing it has made abundantly clear is the constellation of entities that are absolutely fundamental to Alaska Natives way of life, our, our own self-determination. That includes the tribes, that includes the regional housing authorities, that includes the, uh, the, the um, regional nonprofits, the healthcare system, and the Alaska Native corporations. Thank you for that uh, very much. I also want to remind uh, individuals that <clears throat> out there, if you have a question, we'll do our very best. We're coming at the bottom of the hour. So we've got about 35 minutes or so left. But if you have a question, we'll try to get it in. And you can email that question to polar at wilsoncenter.org. Polar at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, Jaylene, is something that uh, Nathan noted that I want to follow up on, and we've, you've all alluded to this, but I, I'd like to put a sharper light on it. And we briefly discussed in the first session. Uh, how shareholders of ANCs are not your, your typical Wall Street shareholder. Uh, so can you explain what it means to be an ANC shareholder and who qualifies? Uh, and if we have time, uh, how you can be both a shareholder and a tribal member? Because I'm sure folks don't understand the differences, and it would be nice to at least get some clarity on that. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I guess, first off, generally, I'd say being a shareholder in a Native uh, in an Alaska Native Corporation means that you share in the ownership of your Native lands. You receive benefits, including dividends, scholarships, job opportunities, cultural benefits. But, you know, it, it actually is very different depending on when you were born as well. Um, original shareholders were those born by December 19th, 1971. So all Alaska Natives who were at least a quarter blood quantum at that time were automatically able to enroll in an Alaska Native Corporation. So those of us, uh, me included, born after 1971, uh, were not originally included as shareholders. It was through amendments to ANCSA that some of us have been able to be included by gifting, where you can have a family member gift you shares or you can inherit it, inherit those shares when your uh, original shareholder passes on. There are also a handful of corporations that have elected to include those born after 1971. We call them descendant shareholders. And so I am also not only a shareholder by gift from my parents, uh, but also in my own right as a descendant uh, in Sea Alaska Corporation. I have my own shares, uh, life estate shares through Sea Alaska. And there's a couple of other INCSA corporations that have done that. So if you meet the qualifications, meaning you descend from an original shareholder and what other, whatever other qualifications that corporation has, you can become a shareholder. Uh, I will say as someone who didn't originally belong, uh, it was very significant to me when my parents gifted me shares. It felt like I belonged to an important organization entity that held our native lands, held our native land settlement, that would protect our lands, that would provide me opportunities and benefits. So belonging to an ANC, I think has much more significance emotionally as an Alaska native person than it would for me to have say purchase shares in um, some other entity like IBM or AT&T or some other, you know, uh, company, because there's a tie, an emotional and cultural tie to what is owned by the native corporation. So I guess that's how I would distinguish it. Thank you for that. Uh, Jason, uh, building on that point, you, correct me, but you were the first descendant shareholder of an Anxer regional corporation to become president and CEO, uh, which is which is a different. Can you explain how your shares were passed down and how this has perhaps shaped your view of the organization like you mentioned before? You bet, Mike. So um, as a non-original shareholder um, and born after December 18, 1971, Jaylene, uh, I missed the cutoff by about five months, but um, my shares were passed on to me through inheritance of my late grandfather, Walter Matrokin. Um, 
and as a non-original shareholder, and again, as a younger person inheriting those shares, uh, I needed to educate myself, my family needed to educate me on what this meant in terms of my rights and responsibilities as a shareholder. Did I feel any different or less or more native as a young man without having these shares? Not necessarily, but once you become connected to your corporation, regional corporation, village corporation, um, there is a sense of belonging and there is a sense of being involved and engaged in an entity that has meaning and that has value. And we can get caught up in, in the important terminology between native corporations and other native organizations, including tribes. But here in Alaska, being involved in your native corporation really means something. I can remember when um, I was on the management team here at Bristol Bay Native Corporation and my predecessor, the late Yalmar Olson, our former president and CEO, was preparing to retire. And while he didn't necessarily identify me personally as his successor, once the board heard of his impending retirement, there was a lengthy discussion around who should be the next president and CEO of the corporation. And I threw my name in the ring, but it was a lengthy discussion. I think I was sitting here until nine o'clock at night waiting for our board to decide, is Jason gonna be our next president and CEO? And many years later, of course, I heard, I heard stories in the boardroom around, is he native enough? Is, does he belong here? And generationally, there are those who, you know, as original shareholders of the corporation, you know, feel as though there's a sense of responsibility and belonging, but passing that torch, passing those shares to the next generation generation, is so meaningful. And as I think about, in our case, PBNC, our corporation has not yet decided to enroll its descendants as shareholders. It's something that we are taking very seriously, but also very uh, taking our time to, to make sure that it's right for the corporation. Um, and so talking to descendants who are not yet shareholders I feel like I have a responsibility as a representative, if you will, of someone who is now a shareholder through inherited shares to figure out a way to make sure that they are engaged, they stay engaged as a descendant or ultimately as a shareholder someday. And so this is a very meaningful discussion amongst the Alaska Native Corporations and no two regions who have enrolled their descendants has done it the same way. And, and how we carve that out, how we determine that path forward for our descendants in the future is going to be very meaningful and very important, but at the same time, very engaging. They want to belong. So thank you for that. And, and we're talking about uh, sort of the future here, right? Descendants and how the corporation moves forward and, and the cycle of how, how you uh, position the corporation to, to serve uh, the people in your communities. So, and I know that under your leadership, you've made very strategic and important investments throughout the Bristol Bay region, especially in what those from the city would call uh, rural areas that are facing unique challenges. So can you describe how BBNC approaches these investments and, and how you see them benefiting your communities? You bet. Um, you know, again, I was named president and CEO in 2009 and thought I knew some things coming into that role um, one of the things that we identified very early on is that we had done business a certain way up until 2009 that we thought could carry us forward well into the future. But having a new perspective, shining a bit of a new light on the corporation and seeing it through my own eyes, we, the board of directors, myself, our executive team, quickly determined that we could no longer do business the way that we had done it, you know, from 1972, in our case, through 2009. And so we developed a new chapter of our history on a go forward basis. And one of the things that we determined that we were very good at was making investments outside of the region, outside of the state uh, to provide a return on our investment back to the corporation. However, making those investments locally, creating job opportunities locally, developing economies and diversifying income sources locally in Bristol Bay has always been really important to the corporation, but we didn't really have a track record to show for it. And so we made uh, an honest decision to invest in the region. And since that time are, are pushing $50 million that we've invested into the Bristol Bay region through acquisition of local businesses, 
creation of new businesses and the development of a, a, a what we call a patient capital or a nurturing capital fund, the Bristol Bay Development Fund, where we're helping local entrepreneurs um, to develop business plans. We're helping local entrepreneurs to grow their business. And we've made investments, we've made acquisitions locally in Bristol Bay through tourism and fuel distribution. But um, while we have the financial capital to make those investments, to make those acquisitions, smaller businesses or even tribes are looking at ways that they can, they can grow organically or that they can develop locally. And so the creation of the Bristol Bay Development Fund to invest capital, to provide, provide lending opportunities, or really just to provide advice. I sort of joke that if you come into the great big city of Anchorage and shake a tree, all these business advisors and consultants will, will fall out and they're just, they're at your fingertips. But when you're living in rural Alaska, that's not the case. And so how can our corporation provide that consultation, provide that advice, advice and counsel, provide that business planning? And so the Bristol Bay Development Fund was created with that intent. Further, um, the Bristol Bay Development Fund has worked similarly to the Sea Alaska region to develop a path to prosperity program where we're uh, engaging local entrepreneurs or individuals who have an idea to put that idea on paper to create a business plan in a competitive environment in which they can develop a business or further a business or grow a business. And I know we've got a video queued up here where we've, through our recent uh, round of Path to Prosperity, where we're providing real investment dollars to those winners of that competition, uh, we've got some great examples of local people who have a business idea, who are ex expanding in their local community to make a difference and to provide jobs and to provide uh, sources of income for individuals and also to provide a service. And so in this video, if we're ready to queue it up, we've got three of our individual winners, uh, uh, June Kagungan with uh, Sugar and Spice Express, which is a, a convenience store and freight forwarding business. We've got Tiffany Bennett and Connor Downey with Little Alaska Fish Company, which is a, a local fish processor. And then uh, Sally and Wassily Gumlikpuk, who have Mike's Legacy, which is a commercial net uh, repair business. And these were the most recent winners of the 2021 Path to Prosperity. Hi, I'm Tiffany. And I'm Connor. Together we own and operate Little Alaskan Fish Company. My name is June Kagungan. I'm the owner of Sugar and Spice Express, which is a convenience store. We are Nick's Legacy, located in Gillingham, Alaska. My name is Sally. This is Wasley, and my son is also. We started in Chignik Lake with one shelf in my mother's living room, and we grew to own this building. 640,000 tons of fishing waste is left in the ocean each year. To eliminate some of this waste, we work with fishermen to reuse and recycle fishing gear. Bristol Bay is my home. I was raised on fish. I know quality salmon. Together, we built this company from the ground up to do more with our catch. Was has been working on nets with his late dad for over 30 years. Net hanging has since been passed down through four generations of our family. We help our community by employing locally, and recently we started working with IGAP and Chignik Lake to recycle our boxes. They will be able to compress them into a log that can burn for hours to heat the homes. We are committed to supporting our community through mentorship, local hiring, and doing business with our neighbors. Thank you, P2P, for this opportunity. Koyana, for your time and consideration. As my Upanik used to say, no nets, no fish, no work, Koyana. Jason, I, ha I had a follow up to that, but it's far more appropriate for you to follow up. Do you want to see anything after that that quick video? It's it's really inspiring to see our shareholders, our local business leaders, and entrepreneurs um, living out their dreams. In in many cases, these are these are ideas that they've created on their own that really help their community diversify. They help their community with uh, with local job opportunities, and and in 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 the best case, we hope these businesses continue well into the future and thrive in ways that we can help support them or provide them access to ways in which they can live out those, those business dreams. Um, we're happy to do it. You know, as a, as a corporation that has succeeded in our market, um, you know, we have found our own success. But to pass that 
opportunity on to individuals and entrepreneurs is so meaningful. Um, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a sizable corporation with business operations around the country and around the globe, but how do we impact local communities, local businesses, uh, so that they can thrive and provide for themselves and their communities? I think it really has come full circle. So we're really proud to be a part of this program. And I know other regions are finding similar success with their, their, their own programs as well. Great. Thank you. And I know all of our corporations have similar examples, but that was just really palpable in a short period of time. Kim, let me, let me turn it over to you. You have a question and then I've got a question from our, our audience that I'll follow up on as well. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice. So uh, there was a question that came in um, that Mike can address, but I think when we look, 2021 is the 50th anniversary of ANCSA. So as we start to look to the next 50 years. I think that as we go through some of the questions that are coming into the queue, if we could hear from each one of you about uh, what you're most excited about in the next 50 years of ANCSA and what you foresee for your corporations and your communities and your shareholders. Anybody want to kick it off? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll say I'm most excited for, I guess, for three big things. Um, you know, the, there, there are a lot of Alaska Native corporations, 12 regionals, 177 uh, villages. Um, the, the regional corporations have all achieved a modicum of success, um, but not all the villages have. And um, I'm most excited to see the development of, um, of many, many of the village corporations, which are small but have large aspirations and um, want to see them um, grow and prosper and, 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 and really develop over, over the next uh, uh, period of time. Um, the second, second thing that springs to mind is that, you know, while all of us um, still consider ourselves to be young, um, there are people that are even younger than us. Um, we were all at one point groomed and, um, and uh, uh, you know, our, our elders uh, took special care to, to, to develop us as leaders. And I'm, uh, I'm getting to the point where I'm excited to see the next generation come up beneath us. Um, when we were kids, the ANCs were there, but they weren't always, you know, uh, uh, having big buildings in, in, in Anchorage or elsewhere. And for the, the kids that are growing up today, that's all they've ever known. And so I'm, I'm curious to see how they interact with and how they take ownership of and uh, began to become leaders in their own right for the corporations. Um, and, and then finally, um, I'm, I'm excited to see the continuation and enhancement of the relationships that we have um, with, with tribes on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis, um, with the other entities that are, that are a part of the ecosystem that, that provide services to Alaska Natives. Um, you know, we, we do have a system that is unique in the world, and um, every institution is better off when the other institutions are strengthened. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to see where, where that's going to go as the tribes build capacity, as the nonprofits build capacity, as the statewide healthcare system builds capacity to better the, the lives of Alaska Natives. I'll jump in. So I guess um, my answer kind of looks back and reflects on how we started and then where we're going. Um, I know that initially our ANCs had to depend a lot on outside consultants, uh, non-natives, uh, the, the few educated Alaska natives that we had at the time. Um, and where we are now is just so many of our young people in our native communities getting educated in so many different areas, whether it's investment, whether it's business, whether it's law, uh, engineering, we have so many uh, opportunities now to reach into our own communities to bring up our organizations, our corporations. I'm excited for all of those new resources that will be coming into our corporations. Even my dad would talk about it. You know, our kids are smarter than we were, is what he would say. And uh, and so he had excitement just for his own kids and his nieces and nephews that were coming up. But, you know, I have kids now that are in college, so I'm excited for everything they're going to learn and bring into these entities, how we're going to continue to evolve these Alaska Native corporations. Uh, 
and how we're doing so much to continue to indigenize these entities. Um, I'm stealing a word from some of our FAI uh, Institute uh, activities, but making these our own. Uh, we started off thinking we had to just be a corporation and I think we've evolved and will continue to evolve into making sure that these are native corporations, that these are native entities that uh, reflect our values and that serve our people and our communities uh, now and well into the future. Uh, and one of the things that we can do and I'm excited about is continuing to market our uniqueness as native people, um, market how uh, strong and resilient we are and the foods that we live off of and the environments that we live in. To market our uniqueness, I think will be something exciting for our future. And then I'm just uh, continuing to focus on uh, one of our missions at CLAC see Alaska, which is to strengthen our people, culture, and homelands. And I think we'll continue to do that um, with our current resources, but also with the future generations that are coming in to further strengthen our people, culture, and homelands. So thank you. I would agree 110% with everything Nathan and Jaylene said, but maybe add on to uh, their thoughts that innovation is really going to be key for us going forward. And yes, we will always celebrate our past and our ancestry and how we came to be. But we have a young generation of descendants and or shareholders. Um, in fact, probably our largest bubble demographically of shareholders is between um, the ages of maybe 15 and 25. And so that's a relatively young population where they should, or we hope, or we can help them have an understanding of our past, but their eyes are on the future. And that future is really now. And to innovate in ways that our founding uh, fathers and founding mothers of our corporations maybe never thought of. Um, in our case, we are just launching, we tried last year, but it was you know another COVID uh, you know, issue, but this year we're kicking off our very first regional culture camp and many other regions in the state have culture camps, but this will be the first region wide culture camp in Bristol Bay. And my hope, my vision is that um, while we ensure to celebrate language, culture, dance, heritage, how can we incorporate STEM technology and how can we incorporate new ways and innovative ways of thinking and matching up our, our ancestry and culture with new ways of thinking. And Kim, you caught me on a good day because yesterday was probably the most innovative day in my career at BBNC where we publicly announced our corporate partnership with the new NHL expansion team in Seattle, the Seattle Kraken. And to our knowledge, at least, this is the first time a professional sports team has dedicated part of its region, including Alaska, uh, and in this case, as well as the Pacific Northwest. But it may be the first time an Alaskan-owned company has partnered with uh, a professional team. And so we're just excited about being able to showcase what all about Bristol Bay um, and, and, and what we can provide in, in a market like Seattle, which is growing very, very rapidly. Um, and so this is just another example of making sure that we stay on, on top of things in an innovative way and we, and we are um, relatable with our young shareholders. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for each of you of touching on innovation and youth. Um, when Jaylene was mentioning her comments, it brought me back to my uh, youngest just uh, exited sixth grade recently. And during their PowerPoint presentations via Zoom, my son's quote was, respect your parents, they pass school without Google. So I, I bring that, that you know, our, our hope and our future is before us and we're all very proud to see them move forward and so thankful that they're gonna be part of our corporations and our culture. So I think we have about 10 minutes left and so we're gonna have to move into what we call speed round, right, Mike? So that we can get a few questions out and get some questions, uh, get some answers with uh, that have been submitted from our uh, viewers one question came in regarding uh, climate change. So if you could answer the 
with climate change impacting food security of subsistence and cultural traditions, what is the long-term plan and types of innovations that you are championing? Anyone want to jump in? I might just tag on to my announcement. Um, as part of our relationship with the NHL uh, Seattle Kraken in, in, in the new Climate Pledge Arena, um, there is a dedication to uh, to climate um, and to sustainable resources and being able to promote through one of the 13 marketplaces within the new Climate Pledge Arena, PBNC will pr be promoting uh, wild sustainable seafood products. And, um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the sustainability, uh, the good stewardship and, and the long-term resources that the Bristol Bay region can provide are of utmost importance to our corporation, our shareholders and our communities but then to showcase that sustainable resource in uh, an arena that will be um, zero emissions uh, and, and probably the first arena in the world to do so is just a very innovative way that we can make a contribution to uh, protecting um, you know, uh, uh, the impacts of, of our changing climate in Seattle, but hopefully someday worldwide. I would just add to that, Sea Alaska has also moved towards an investment in foods and sustainable foods and the importance of our, the foods that we've traditionally eaten to, to feed our communities. Um, I also um, am proud of our Sea Alaska investment in carbon programs to um, have some carbon projects to offset the uh, emissions throughout the country, throughout the, the world. So we have made a huge investment in, in in, I guess, addressing the carbon footprint uh, in, this, in this state and in this country. Another thing that we have found important uh, in our success is investing in the protection of our traditional foods, uh, whether it's through lawsuits, whether it's through advocacy in administrations at the state and federal level to make sure that our people continue to be able to use uh, and harvest and gather our traditional foods. We've had many conflicts over the years. It's one of the biggest conflicts. We could have an entire Wilson Center event on our traditional foods and our access to those. Um, but that's another area where we invest significantly is advocacy and litigation to protect our traditional way of life. Uh, just uh, just to add, you know, we're we're uh, you know dedicated on a day to day basis to ensuring our our shareholders have the ability to hunt and fish, uh, collect as they, they did, uh, um, you know, we, we are witnessing, you know, changes in, in population dynamics and are actively engaged with regional partners, um, cross regional partners, international partners, um, in order to understand and address it. Um, it's, it's no, no, no problem is within the bounds of a single ANC, the collection of ANCs, uh, the collection of, of native institutions to be able to to be able to effectively address. So it, it requires a very broad group of hands holding together to to be able to understand it and then to start working to solve it. Thank you. I want to take us. Uh, we've got what eight minutes left, seven minutes left. I want to take us maybe in a different direction, a complementary direction. Uh, at the Wilson Center and with other colleagues, we talk about the Arctic in many different ways, right? There's, there are very different Arctics. They're very different Alaskas, but certainly different Arctics. Sometimes we talk about the North American Arctic. In fact, a lot, we talk about the North American Arctic, Alaska, Canada, Greenland. And so we know that there is shared culture, there's shared interests, there's lots of shared. We always, People think north south and they think the Arctic, we like making it east west or, or west east. So, thinking in, the, in those terms and in terms of your investment ethos, the mission, the vision, communities that you serve, uh, all, all of the issues you brought up today, we have a question from a colleague asking what about Greenland? Uh, are, are the corporations or are you looking at opportunities to work with Greenland? Obviously, in the news a lot now for a lot of different reasons. Would it be very interesting to get your input on if you currently work with, with the government of Greenland or if you have opportunities to work with the government agreement, we would like to hear about that. Uh, and again, something that, uh, as Jaylene said, we've got a lot of programs for Wilson Center to help support like food security, but this could be yet another one in and of itself. But let me ask, ask the group that in the, in the few minutes we've got left. We, we don't we don't currently within within Tana, but I sit on the Arctic Economic Council as um, one of the 
um, permanent participants uh, with the Aleut International Association. And that's a, a core piece of what we're, we're doing is uh, fostering um, um, international um, understanding and, and the mix of uh, potential projects wherever they are. You know, um, you know the, the Arctic is changing very, very rapidly. And so uh, there's, there's a host of opportunities that are gonna be presenting themselves. Um, I'd love to visit Nook at some point. I heard it's a beautiful little town. Uh, but uh, you know the, the the Danes are there, the Norwegians are there, the six permanent participants are there, and, and that's where um, a lot of projects are being discussed on a, on a, on a real time basis. So it's something we're going to continue to look at. Um, inevitably, we'll, something's going to stumble across our path, but uh, nothing at this moment. Well, I, I I guess I would just add that we've made some recent investments in international foods, uh, acquiring a, an interest in foods in New England or in England. Um, we've had some discussions with entities in Iceland, so Greenland's certainly not off the off the path of potential um, opportunities and maybe business partnerships. I know that some of the um, other Arctic countries uh, are very innovative in terms of energy use and sustainable foods production. So we do have some of those discussions going on, and I'm sure Greenland's another area where we can have some outreach and collaboration. And similarly, while BBNC doesn't currently have any investments or we're not in discussions on investments in Greenland specifically today, we have had past investments in Iceland as well. We're a fairly new uh, investor in the seafood landscape, uh, having acquired uh, long line Pacific cod vessels and a business in the, um, while it's based in Seattle, it's uh, fishery is the Bering Sea. Um, and so BBNC in the seafood space or in other sectors um, doesn't leave anything off the table and geographically. So Greenland could certainly be a target for us on a go forward basis. Wonderful, thank you. We, we, we too think that there's, a, there's lots of opportunity uh, in the North American Arctic. And I know that there's interest from, from the Greenlandic side, especially having the consulate in Nuuk uh, from the United States up and running and looking for economic development opportunities. It, it's a natural, especially with the, the relationship between Greenland and Alaska. Uh, so, you know, perhaps that's, a, that's another program down the road. Uh, Kim, there's one last question we might be able to squeeze in for a minute or so. Do you want to take that or would you like me to do it? Just very quickly. Go ahead, Mike. You're on a roll. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know about that, but how, how do you? So, for the group, maybe maybe a lightning round. How do you foresee any modifications to ANXA that will help our future generations adapt in our changing Arctic? Do you see more interconnectivity with our tribes? And that's more from our friend Jackie Schaefer. I guess for me, uh, anything we can do to amend ANCSA to strengthen the recognition of us as native entities, as native uh, organizations that were created by Congress to serve native people. Um, I guess I would just continue to look for ways to strengthen that recognition and our relationship with the federal government to make sure that we serve Alaska natives fully and completely in collaboration with our tribes. Uh, anything to protect that special relationship uh, and uh, reflect that trust responsibility that the federal government has to Alaska Natives. So that would be certainly a focal point for me. I would quickly add that just the connotation as we talked about throughout this session of what a corporation is or is not, we work very closely with the tribes in our region and around the state in, in a, in a uh, cohesive way to ensure that they're successful as we're successful. And, you know, corporations are not a bad thing at the end of the day. It's a moniker that we've all been given by Congress, but we're doing um, what we can to ensure a thriving culture, a thriving population, and a thriving state here in Alaska. And we do that hand in hand with our tribes. Yeah, what they said. That was, that was easy. Kim, why don't, why don't I, <laughs> thank you, Nathan, looking at the clock. Uh, Kim, why don't I uh, ask you for any last of your thoughts and then I'll sign off. You bet, you bet. Well, thank you to all of you. Um, just like our last event, I wish we had much more time to, to dive in. Thank you to Jaylene, Nathan, and Jason for your just very powerful stories today. 
Um, and, and thank you to all of us who joined us virtually for this event. We hope this discussion helped to better illuminate our Alaska Native corporations and our mission, and perhaps even correct some of the misperceptions that have existed in our organization since Congress uh, deemed them Alaska Native corporations almost 50 years ago. We welcome forums such as the Wilson Center to share more about Alaska Native people and our communities and our organizations, because it's just essential that people and policymakers and our news outlets understand who we are and our ecosystem so that our policies and programs benefit all indigenous communities. Alaska Native corporations may be structured differently than other indigenous entities, but our commitment to serving our people and communities are the same. We hope you'll join us for our next session where we'll take a deeper dive into ANCSA and celebrate the progress that's been achieved by Alaska Native people and their organizations over the last 50 years and look to what's ahead of still to come. Finally, I wanna give one last huge thank you to Mike and the rest of the team at the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center. Your team continues to be an enormous partner and we are so looking forward to the next event and the series to come. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kim, for the kind words. It's nice when the missions are aligned and complementary. Um, so we, we welcome the future collaboration. I want to thank all of these wonderful leaders for being with us today. And I want to thank the global audience for, for listening and also participating. And I apologize for not getting to the other questions. And as always, thank you to Michaela Stith for keeping us on course and the incredible broadcast team back there at the Wilson Center at the Reagan Building for their support. And I thank all of our colleagues and friends for tuning in today. Thank you so much and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>